Good evening, everybody. Let me welcome you to the Ames courtroom uh, and a, uh, another film production sponsored by the uh, Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. My name is Charles Ogletree, a faculty member here uh, and the founder of the Institute. Uh, and I'll say more about uh, Bonnie Boswell, who I've known for a very long time, who is uh, both the executive producer and the director uh, uh, and everything else of this film. I'll, I'll talk about her in just a minute. Uh, we're doing a number of things that I wanted to mention in addition to the power broker that you'll see uh, tonight. Coming up in October, uh, here in the Ames courtroom, uh, we're going to have two programs. Uh, one, actually, it's going to be in Washington Stream 2019, the new building on Friday, with a collection of people doing uh, education uh, and uh, public service issues. We're going to have the Opportunity Agenda uh, from Washington, D.C., Boston Rising from here in Boston, the uh, uh, Youth uh, to Police and Partnership group that's here in Roxbury, and uh, also Mothers Against Justice uh, and Equality, Mothers for Justice and Equality, MJE, here in, in, in uh, Boston on Friday uh, afternoon. And then a wonderful presentation about implicit bias by my colleague who's at the uh, Ed School, uh, is uh, Professor Banaji. And then on Saturday, uh, it, this, this is a program to celebrate uh, the 55th anniversary of Little Rock, uh, Arkansas Central High School. And it's titled, uh, with a clever title always by my uh, direct managing director, David uh, Harris, it's called Between Little Rock and a Hard Place. Who else other than David Harris can come up with a title like that? And, and that's the 55th anniversary. The uh, five of the Little Rock nine will be here on Saturday morning. Uh, we'll also have Professor uh, Ken Mack, who's written a book about civil rights lawyers uh, speaking, and then have a fabulous lunch uh, that day, a box lunch, uh, uh, and with a, a number of uh, authors of books about Little Rock and about President Eisenhower speaking, uh, including uh, both uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Jim uh, Newton uh, and Dave Nichols, uh, who've written extensively about issues, but also about Eisenhower and Little Rock Nine. And then we'll have in the afternoon a, an argument, a re-argument of the case called Oglethorpe uh, versus the Harris uh, Walled Township. Uh, my students took Oglethorpe as the closest thing to Ogletree. So it's, I, I'm Chad Oglethorpe, but there's going to be a re-argument about what's, what race and education means in the 21st century after looking back from 1957. We have Justice Stephen Breyer uh, and about a dozen circuit court judges, including uh, James Graves from the Fifth Circuit uh, in Mississippi, uh, and also we have uh, from the Second Circuit Judge Lawyer uh, from the Second Circuit. Uh, from the Fourth Circuit, we have Judge Wynn, uh, Judge Roger uh, Gregory, uh, and Judge Allison Duncan, uh, and uh, as well from the Sixth Circuit, uh, uh, Judge Bernice Donald, uh, from the Seventh Circuit, Judge uh, Ann Williams, uh, also from the Third Circuit, uh, uh, judge Keyes, who is the chief judge of that circuit. A lot of interesting judges who will be here in hearing the debate. And what's so unique about it, they will hear the lawyers argue the case for an hour, and then the second hour, instead of going back and deliberating, they will deliberate live in front of uh, the audience and tell you what they think about the cases, the lawyers, the arguments. Uh, and they can be pretty condescending, so I feel bad for the lawyers, but that, that happens. So October 12th and 13th here, and as with all of our events, is free and open to the public. Uh, the following week on Thursday, we have a really terrific documentary called uh, Electoral Dysfunction about all the uh, problems in elections in America uh, and uh, voting. Uh, and it's sponsored by the Institute, uh, the Charles Hammond Houston Institute, and the Institute of Politics at uh, Harvard, uh, the uh, Kennedy School. Uh, it's uh, at 5.30, uh, and we hope you'll come to see that. And finally, uh, on October 25th, the week the following Thursday at 6 o'clock, we have Life After Murder. Uh, and this is uh, Five Men in Search of Redemption by uh, Nancy Mullane, five people who've done incredible work uh, in their lives after being uh, sentenced to uh, life in prison and, and uh, the great things that they've done in, in relief of that. Tonight, uh, we have a, a film by, uh, uh, said Bonnie Boswell, about a remarkable American uh, and uh, someone who died much uh, too early and much too young. Uh, Whitney Young uh, grew up uh, in Kentucky, uh, took his family uh, to other parts of the country, uh, was very active uh, in a number of organizations, including becoming the uh, president of the National Urban League and had an incredible campaign. 
Uh, and this uh, tells you about how he was, in a sense, in my view, the godfather of civil rights who, after so many of our great leaders uh, were fallen, uh, assassinated, uh, he stood up uh, and stood strong to make sure that jobs and other priorities were part of our civil rights uh, agenda for the uh, uh, 1960s and beyond, uh, and died much too young uh, in 1971 at only 49 years old. But this documentary talks about his life, his efforts, and his legacy. Uh, Bonnie, as many people should know, is a graduate of this uh, university, Harvard University, and also a graduate student from uh, MIT down the street. Uh, she's been an award-winning uh, reporter, a producer, a commentator, and a talk, ho a talk show host. Uh, she has won the Golden Mike Award uh, for a one-hour uh, news program she created for NBC. Uh, and she also was a news reporter for NBC in the Los Angeles office and a co-host of a national cable television news talk show. Uh, and an associate producer in ABC's 2020. She's been very much committed to bringing, uh, in a sense, truth to power and through the media and a remarkable person uh, in that regard. And she'll say a few words about uh, the, this movie, which was uh, her life's work, a very important work, uh, and, and how she involved not just herself, but her whole family to bring finally to the fore uh, the great work of Whitney Young, uh, and after you hear a few words from uh, Bonnie uh, before the film is shown, then she'll come back and answer questions after it. Please uh, join me in welcoming to the audience and to the microphone, Bonnie Boswell. Thank you all for being here tonight. This is a dream come true. The fact that it is finished at all is a dream come true. I've never been an independent filmmaker before, and it was certainly a new journey for me. Um, of course, so much of the good stuff you never see in the film, so I will just briefly tell you that this, of course, it has been a labor of love, but it's really a, a four-generation dialogue on race in America. Uh, and you'll see in the film, it kind of starts with my grandparents and what they learned. Actually, my, my uncle was born at a school campus that was a result of a landmark Supreme Court decision in, in um, Brea College versus Kentucky. And that's kind of where the whole thing starts. Um, and it was my grandfather's understanding of race relations and his relationship to it and my uncle's interpretation, my mom's, my own. And then finally, my son, who uh, helped to become, who was the co-director of this film. Um, and so I hope that you will see all the layers that are there. Uh, it's been exciting for us. It's been uh, so educational for me, and uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot to say later on. So please enjoy. Thank you. We really, it was a truly moving experience, and we really thank you for sharing it with us. And now, for those of you in the audience, uh, Bonnie will talk to us a little bit about the film and take some questions. Thank you again. Thank you, David. Before I forget, because I always forget to do the, the promotional stuff, uh, this film is going to be on PBS. It will be on uh, February 18th, 2013. So please look for it and tell your friends about it. We want people to know about it. And I have some cards up here just will help you to remember that. So anyway, um, yeah, as I said, it was a, a labor of love. People have asked me, when did I start or why did I start? And uh, just briefly, I was asked, when my mom passed away, I was asked to speak on behalf of the family at an event uh, that was named after Whitney Young. And it got me thinking about, you know, what, what do we mean by leadership in America? What does it take to be a great American leader? And as I was thinking about Uncle Whitney's capacity to really bridge the gap between such disparate groups, I thought, you know, this is the kind of leadership we really need to lift up so that we can be encouraged, so that we can have hope, so that we don't get locked in our particular camps. And so that kind of started the uh, adventure for me of putting it together so that, you know, hopefully as people do see this, that they can be inspired and can know that, you know, this is the American dream that we all believe in. And uh, one of the things that I really wanted to bring out um, was, and th that really, I think, touched me, was the fact that um, Whitney Young, like many African-American men and women at that time, was able to go and participate in a segregated army and fight for democracy overseas. You know, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> I just don't know how you do that. Um, but, but they were able to do that because their passion for the dream of American ideals was greater than their personal suffering. 
And to me, this is an extraordinary thing, an extraordinary kind of lesson of uh, nobility of the human spirit is that you know, they could restrain you know, what must have been really aggravating for them uh, and the anger, the humiliation, all those things. But rather than give into that, they maintained their sense of who they were. That never wavered, but they had a higher purpose and they were willing to go through what they went through in order to have that higher purpose. So I think that's another important lesson. So anyway, those are just a couple of things that I wanted to share, but does anybody have any questions about anything? I've yes. heard that uh, many people have commented, you know, that Whitney Young, had he lived, uh, would have played an even more pivotal role because there weren't that many people left uh, of that particular generation. But he, as a person who, remember, he was a dean of students before he became a national civil rights leader. So he was the guy who was always looking to reach out to younger people. So he had a, a lot of skill sets that he brought to the table that um, I think really would have played into that. But I, I, will, I appreciate your uh, lifting up the, uh, the, the uh, funeral that was in Nigeria, and I would love to uh, talk to you about that footage. There, of course, there's so many things that we're not able to put in the film. We, you know, we had a strict time of you know, 53 minutes, 28 seconds. You know? So there are a lot of things that were not there. But the beauty of internet, you know, we can get a lot more stuff on, so nothing will be lost. You know, what are the similarities between our current situation and what Whitney was dealing with? And, um, you know, I think the, those similarities are very real and stark because, you know, and Martin Luther King talked about this as well, you know, that when you have, you know, wars going on overseas, that has a direct impact on the ability to do domestic programs here. You know, they're, they're, they're related. And all the isms, racism, sexism, you know, all these things, they, they reinforce one another. And so I think it is about uh, being able to, as Martin Luther King says, it's always right to do right. And if you can hone to, you know, your basic principles, then I think you can stay the course. Um, and of course, you know, Whitney, you can see the transition he made in terms of his position on Vietnam. I mean, he was being very pragmatic initially, being able to understand that Lyndon Johnson had worked very hard for the civil rights movement and, want, and wanting to honor that, you know, uh, relationship. But in the end, ultimately, you know, he did come out against the war because there, it was impacting the programs that he had worked for, and he could see that that connection. So I think that for us, the takeaway is, you know, if we, you know, we can see all the money that's getting, gets drained constantly from America. Uh, and, you know, can we put this back into our own uh, programs at home is the question. And do we have the, the will to do it? You know, these things have been going on for a long time. The circle has been happening for quite some time. And I think a lot of times, you know, this is my personal opinion, is that we default in our responsibility in letting politicians make those choices. But I think the, the more relevant piece for us is, it is about we the people. It is, you know, it is or it isn't, and we have to decide if it's gonna be the we the people, because if it is we the people, then we have to make the choice. You know, where do we want our tax dollars to go? You know, and if we, if we care, then we have to have voice. And we can't wait for others to do it for us. We don't get a pass on that. And I think that we have to find it in our own ways. Everybody has a different way to do it. Somebody might be a social worker, or somebody might be a gardener. I mean, there's so many things, but they all touch some kind of way. And I think it's just our personal responsibility to do, do the right thing. So it's a long question, but um, hopefully I've answered some of that. You know, one of my favorite sayings <clears throat> is that um, the lion king of beasts seek no, seeks no companions. And I think it's because, you know, at a certain point, you know, when you make the hard choices, that you do find yourself alone. But I think at the same time, it's important to have a reference point that gives you courage in the dark times, in the alone times. And for Uncle Whitney, his father was that person. So I think we all need a mentor in life. We all need that person, whether they are alive or dead or whatever, but somebody who represents our ideals 
and his, who can, can give us backbone when we need it. So I think the fact that his father, that he saw his father walk a very difficult, lonely path too. But he, there was integrity in that. And, you know, and he admired it. And so that's what I know personally that he would hearken back to is the kind of dignity that was required of Whitney Sr. to be able to hold that school together uh, in a very difficult time to make those difficult decisions. I mean, he didn't want to take those kids out of their classrooms. That's not, I mean, he was an academic. He was not, but, but he had to make the hard choice of how we're going to get this school funded. And so, you know, he, he, he did what he had to do. So that was a lonely moment for him too. But I think, you know, Uncle Whitney was able to see the pragmatic value of that ultimately. So I think as long as you can find somewhere along the way that person who gives you that encouragement in your heart to continue to do the right thing, I think that sees you over the difficult places. Well, thank you for your question. I think we were just trying to portray what was going on. We weren't really trying to do anything else except shine the light on what was taking place. Because a lot of times you don't know the behind the scenes. It's like going to the restaurant. You don't know what, how it's being made in the back room. And one of the things I enjoyed about doing this film was seeing you know, the stuff that happens. And, you know, it was the wheeling and dealing between Lyndon Johnson and you know, Whitney Young at a crucial moment. And you know, the human nature of things. Right? Because, you know, we're just talking, whether it's Stokely or Martin Luther King or Whitney Young, we're talking people here. And I, I defy you to find any political, social group where there's not some of that stuff going on, right? It's people. People have different personalities. There's ego this, there's that. I mean, you know, and the Girl Scout troops or the this, you know, and you're, I mean, it's just part of life, right? So I think, you know, it's certainly true in that group. But I think what's important and what, what was, important in terms of Whitney's role in that was that he was a mediator. And he was a mediator, this is one of the things I learned by doing the film, which is not in the film, but uh, by doing it, I, when I was interviewing uh, Dorothy Height, I asked about this mediator role, because this was, this was why Whitney Young was essential in the mix. And I said to her, I said, well, I heard, I knew that he was charismatic, I knew he had a great sense of humor, um, I said, so why do you think he was playing this mediator role? And what enabled him to play this role between these disparate groups of, of people and different personalities? And she looked at me with great intention and said, well, we, we speaking of herself and Whitney Young, she said, we are social workers. And that my, a little light went off in my head when she said that. Because what she meant by that was, you know, that, that beyond the personality, there were skill sets that were brought into, that are part of the profession of social workers to keep people at the table, right? So the point of that, showing all of that was to show what was going on, but to show his role as a mediator. And again, the value of that, because if you look at our current political climate, what you see are a lot of personalities, right? But it's very hard to find the mediators. And isn't that really what we need when you look around, everybody's going, oh, there's here and there's there and there, you know. But where's the mediator, right? So, so one of the things I wanted to do was to lift up the value of the mediator, the guy who's behind the scenes, who you don't know as well as Martin Luther King, but who plays an essential role. Because these are the people we need to knit the disparate groups together. So I think, in answer to your question, we have all these roles. And they, more than anybody else, understood the role each one of them played. They were very aware of it, right? Um, but you know, you have to have somebody who can bring it together. And I think that for, for our purposes, to be able to assi assign value to that role is really important. Again, one of the um, singular things about Whitney Young was that he was that guy who could go to the corporate boardroom and be very comfortable. And again, if you, once you see, say, as you have seen, his background, you understand why that is, that he you know, was able to you know, have this um, you know, wonderful, although difficult environment, you know, in a segregated environment, he was able to get certain competences of that experience. But one of my favorite stories uh, was about his trip to uh, Eastern Europe with the heads of Fortune 500 companies. 
And um, to your point, you know, the men on this trip, we're talking Henry Ford and you know, all these, these guys, and, and they uh, said they'd never really interacted with an African-American as a peer, which is what John Lennon said. They had, act, they had, they had these you know, stereotypes, but never as a direct peer. And Whitney was clearly that. And so one of the guys said at the end of the trip, kind of slapped him on the back and said, gee, Whitney, you know, if more people were like you, we wouldn't have any problem. And uh, he, said, he said, if, if, if more, uh, he said, if more Negroes were like you, we wouldn't have any problem. To which Whitney Young said immediately, yes, and if more white people were like me, we wouldn't have any problem. <laughs> so I think that's it. But, I, but, but you know, I've gone to my kid's school and you know, people have assumed I'm the nanny, you know. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you again so much, Bonnie. I think all of us uh, recognize and realize that uh, uh, this is not only a labor of love, but this is a family affair, and that <clears throat> in listening to Bonnie, we're all as inspired as we are from the film. <clears throat> I do want to repeat uh, what Bonnie said, that the film will be on public television February 18th. I think it's up to all of us to spread the word about that. Uh, we hope to have another screening of this and uh, hope to get Bonnie back again. Uh, in the meantime, uh, again, there, there are these cards up here to remind you uh, there's a little food in back you can take with you, and there are little sheets up here about our upcoming events. So on behalf of Professor Ogletree, the law school, uh, and Harvard, I want to